going to continue this week in our series in the book of Acts. And, you know, Acts is a long, long book, so we're going to be in this for probably the next year. But I think it is really important for us as a church because Acts is a book that really unpacks the journey of the early church and what it went through, some of the things that happened. And, you know, one of the things that happens is when you preach from a book of the Bible instead of verse by verse or topically, you hit a couple of passages they're a little bit more difficult to preach on than others. And this is one of those weeks. Because we're going we're gonna to move forward and we're going to meet a couple in a moment who don't exactly do things the way they should. So, so we've got a bit of a, you know, so we're going to cover some of the stuff that isn't normally covered today. So it's not going to be one of those messages to start off with where, you know, we talk about all the exciting things that happen. Because, you know, life isn't like that, is it? Sometimes there's difficulties, sometimes there's troubles, and sometimes people don't do what they're supposed to do. So we're going to touch on that today. So before we do, let's pray, and then we'll dig into the Word. Lord God, thank you that you are here, that your presence is with us, Lord. Father, thank you that we can turn to you, Lord God, and we can worship you, but that we can learn to grow closer to you, Lord. Father, speak to us this morning through your word, Lord. Convict and challenge us where we need convicted and challenged, and inspire us where we need inspiring. Lord, thank you that you are in this place. We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I said, the trouble with teaching whole books of the Bible is you have to touch on the stuff that's a little bit more complicated and a little bit more difficult. So today we're going to talk about the story of a couple called Ananias and Zephira. And it's often a a bit in the Bible that's used completely wrongly by, by churches because people use this wrongly as a way to encourage people in their giving. Now, You'll, we'll read the Bible verse in a minute, but let me tell you, I am not telling you that if you don't give, you will be struck down and die. That is not what this message is about, okay? However, it has been used that, and that's a misuse of this Bible verse. You see things like that. That's not what it's about. This message is not about giving. It's actually about your heart. This message is not about, you know, um, giving everything you've got to the church, although if you're sat here and you really want to give everything you've got to the church, I'm not going to discourage that. That would be really beneficial. But no, it's actually more about where your heart is, and that's what we're going to cover today. So before Easter, we looked at the early church, didn't we? And actually, the verse that we looked at beforehand saw people selling everything they had and giving it to the church so that all the needs within the church were met. How great would it be to be a church where all our needs are met? A place where if you have a need, someone else in the church can back you up and help you. That's what we talk about when we talk about everyone cares. It's a place where together we can meet the needs of those around us. Do you know this church that we read in the verses before seems like it's full of perfect people doing perfect things, doesn't it? The apostles are preaching with fire. You know, the, the, everybody's getting saved. There's, there's healings happening. There's miracles going on. Everybody's going, hey, let's just sell up and go with the church. Everything seems to be perfect people doing perfect things. But actually, Acts 5 shows us a slightly different side of the church. And what we see is actually imperfect Christians. And that not everybody in the church is perfect. Do you know, I I heard a quote once and it said this, it said, um, if you find a perfect church, when you get there, it won't be perfect anymore. (laughs) Each and every one of us is imperfect, aren't we? We aren't perfect. We don't always get it right. As a pastor, I won't always get it right. I say this all the time, just so you don't get really disappointed when I don't get it right. You know, we don't get it right. We are people, we make mistakes. And this story shows us some of those imperfections. So, Oliver Cromwell was the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. Everybody knows who Oliver Cromwell was, doesn't he? Don't they, don't we? Or do we need to go back and do a full history lesson? He's the one that chuffed off Charles's head, all of that stuff. You know, he was, he, yeah, 
I'll not go into history. I'm not very good at it. But anyway, Oliver Cromwell um, was a parliamentarian, he, you know, many years ago. And, he, and at the time, an artist was commissioned to paint Oliver Cromwell's portrait. Now, Cromwell wasn't the most attractive of chaps. In fact, Cromwell had warts all over his face. And at the time, the artist thought, I know what I'll do. I'll do my painting, and I'll leave the warts and things out to make Cromwell more attractive. And then when he sees the painting, he'll go, wow, aren't I handsome, and aren't you such a great artist? Anyway, on receiving the painting, Cromwell, he sent it back, he sent it back to the artist, and what he demanded was that he be painted warts and all. And this service is going to be one of those warts and all services. Do you know, one of the beautiful things about the Bible is what we don't see is we don't see a perfect church. I love the fact that if you start at the beginning of the Bible in the Old Testament and you work all the way through to the book of Revelation, what you see is a lot of people who make a lot of mistakes, but God loves them anyway. And that is so important. So let's have a look at these warts and all verses that we're going to look at. Acts 5, 1 um, verses 1 to 11 is a passage that actually, if I was writing a story about the church and I was writing, you know, this is the early church, I'd probably leave this bit out. But they didn't. Because we want to see the imperfect moments. We need to see the church warts and all. Because us as a church, do you know what? That's how we'll grow as individuals. So let's dig into this. Let's do Acts 5, 1 to 11 to start off with. And it says this. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your while it sorry, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When, Ananias heard, when Ananias, Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard it. Y- you would imagine so. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. But it doesn't stop there. An interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And S- Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young man came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And a great fear came across the whole church and upon all who heard these things." It's one of those moments in the Church of England, you would say, this is the word of the Lord, and everybody would go, thanks be to God. (sighs) Do you know what I want to say is, what this story is about, it is not about giving. It's not about Ananias and his gift, it's about his motivation. You know, it's about what he brought. What he did was he brought part of a gift while telling everybody he was bringing the whole thing. He was posturing. And where I want to start, and the first point that I want to make, is that motivation matters. Do you know, this is not that story about giving, but it's warning about the heart. Your motivation matters. Let me ask, what is your motivation behind the things that you do? Why do you do the things that you don't? Now, we don't fully know Ananias' motivation, but from this scriptural narrative, we can actually hazard a guess why he behaved the way that he wanted, that he actually behaved. So I want to have a look at a few, at a couple of things that I think may have been behind why Ananias did what he did, but then I also want to have a look at actually what we should do. So let's have a look at this thing, motivation matters. I believe that Ananias, what he did was, he had a love 
of wealth. He had a love of accumulating wealth. His value was in what he had in his wallet. Do you know, he sold this land, and as everybody else was giving to the church, he said, yeah, I'm going to give all the proceeds of my land to the church, but he didn't. He filled his pocket first and then gave a little bit to God. Now, 1 Timothy 6.10 is probably one of the most... It's all right, it's not on your screen, Karen, so you don't need to look for it. It's one of the most misquoted Bible verses that you'll ever hear. Everybody says this. They say, money is the root of all evil. But that's actually not what the verse says. And then everybody then goes to say, well, actually what the verse says is the love of money is the root of all evil. But that's not what the verse actually says. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So do you know, it's not saying that money itself is bad. There is nothing wrong with being wealthy. So, you know, if you're worth, you know, millions and millions like Andrew at the back, you know, it's okay. You're allowed to be wealthy. There's nothing in the Bible that says that you can't be. It's where you place your wealth in the grand scheme of who you are. It's the love of money. If money is your everything, then you are going to fail. Hebrews 13.5 expands on that and it says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Do you know, as an individual, I um, spend a lot of years in the sales industry. I I worked for, uh, in the motor trade to start off with and then moved into the energy industry. And they are cutthroat sales environments. In those environments, your income is determined by how much you sell what you do. It's, you know, it's performance-related pay. And for me, I was very good at it. And it meant that money became so important to me at the time where it was about I was successful because I wanted more. I wanted the lifestyle. I wanted the stuff. I wanted all the things. I loved what that brought with it. But you know, that isn't where value happens. And I love that this verse in Hebrew says, be content with what you have. Do you know what? Right now, I don't earn the same level of money as I earned when I was in the energy industry. But you know what? I believe that now I am content with what I have. And do you know what happens is when you, when you have this love of money, what happens is you always want more. Do you know, I've got friends who are multi-millionaires. But you know what? They've never got enough. They always want more. It's never quite good enough. There is that striving for more. Do you know, whatever you place above God in your life, will become your God. Let me say that again. Whatever you place above God in your life will become your God. Godly success is not the same as earthly success. And this is where Ananias fell short because he was searching for success in those things that the world says was successful. Having more money, driving a nice car, living in a big house, all of this stuff. That's not where your success lies. Do you know, I remember a while ago, I I looked at this word success and looked at it from a biblical point of view. And actually, basically, if you want to be successful as a Christian, just use the gifts that God has given you to be his witness. That's what he's called you to do. Uh, Pull closer to him, get to know him more, develop your relationship with him. And out of that, he will meet your needs in other places. Notice I say needs, not wants. Do you know, sticking a picture of a Ferrari on your fridge and going, Lord, give me a Ferrari, will not necessarily get you a Ferrari. But saying, God, I'm struggling and I need your help, will see you meet your needs and see you not want for, for something that you need. So firstly, wealth, you know, a love of wealth, a love of money, a love of something else is never going to see you through. And this is one of the places that Ananias fell short The second thing where Ananias fell short was a love of adulation, a love of the spotlight. Do you know, Jesus spoke against adulation, self-centered adulation, more than anything else. When Jesus was coming against something, it was always people who put their own ambitions first. Let's look at the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Do you know that 
whole tale was nothing to do with money. The hero of the story was a tax collector. It was about their self-adulation, how they wanted to look in front of others. Is everybody with me? Because this is a hard one, isn't it? This isn't a nice, shiny, sunny message. This is looking at some of those things that can bring us down and can cause us difficulties as individuals. Do we worry how we look in front of others? The Pharisee and the tax collector was a story where you had a guy who was a Pharisee, a leader at the time. People would look up to him, but there he was posturing in the temple courts. Look at me as I pray. Aren't I amazing? Not like this tax collector. And on the other hand, there was the tax collector who was sat over here saying, Lord, have mercy on me. A humble sinner. I'm sorry. And the question was, who was justified in the eyes of God? It was the one who humbly sought him. How do you approach God this morning? Do you care more about how you look in front of others than how you look to God? Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't have to give. Do you know, the whole issue is not that they had to sell everything. The church did not say, sell everything you've got, you must do this. No, people were doing it out of love for the cause of Christ. They were doing it because of what was happening in the day. They didn't have to sell up. They didn't even have to, once they'd sold up, give everything to the church. But what they did was they came to the apostles with half of what they got and told them it was everything. They held that bit about back from themselves. Do you know, they could have actually, Ananias could have gone to Peter and said, hey, Peter, we've sold our house, and here's half of what we got for the house. Put that into the work of the church. But that's not what he did. What he did was he said, here's everything that I got for my house. He was posturing, because in the verse earlier, all these people were doing the same, and they were getting plauded for it and saying, hey, great, aren't you doing well? So he's like, well, I want, I want that adulation. I want that respect. So he kind of show, he, he does the same thing, but it's a lie. It's a deceit. Your value is not in how others perceive you. It's in who God says you are. Do you know, let me encourage you this morning, it doesn't matter how I view you. Although I love you all, you're all awesome and amazing. Do you know, it doesn't matter what people say about you at work. It doesn't matter what others think of you. It doesn't matter if you get negative comments on social media, if you don't get the likes that you like on Instagram, if you don't, you know, get all the followers on TikTok, whatever, you know, because I'm sure, ma'am, you have loads of TikTok followers. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, you look for these adulation in different places and it is worthless. And if you are looking for adulation in what others think, you are only going to be disappointed because there will always come a day when that adulation turns into something else. Your value is not in how others perceive you. It's in who God says you are. And you know what God says you are is totally different because actually what God says about you is he says, you are my child, you are adopted into my family, you are made in my image, I love you, I sent my son to die on a cross to set you free. This is who God says you are. You are God's children and he loves you. Let me encourage you, be known by how you show Jesus, not how you appear. Do you know what will happen? If you try and do it all in your own strength and in your own look at me, it will all go wrong. Your reputation will be destroyed. It won't happen. You will get found out. Because, do you know, when you approach something deceitfully, when you try and show something that isn't true you will always get found out. Do you know we've seen that recently, haven't we, with internationally renowned ministers who've been caught having affairs. They've lived a facade and they've thought that that stuff that was happening in the background would never get found out. Well, it did because they were living the lie. Don't let your lie get found out. God sees your heart. He sees what you do in the same way that Ananias and Zephyra 
God knows what was going on. They saw beyond the lie. Don't live that lie. Live as righteous children of God. Do you know, let me give you a bit of hope at the moment about that. Living as a righteous child in God is not as tough as you may think. Because it's not actually about what you do. It's about what Jesus did for you. So when God sees you, if you are in relationship with him, he sees the righteousness of Christ in you. And therefore, you can live differently. And yes, you can make mistakes. Yes, you can get it wrong. Yes, we can all fall short. Because we do, don't we? But we are living from a place of salvation and righteousness. Be known by how you show Jesus So motivation matters. Don't live out of a love of adulation. Don't live out of a love of accumulation. I just tried to get the double A's in there, but basically means wealth. Live, have your motivation, be a love for Jesus and his church. In verse 4, 32 to 37, we see a church in, sorry, chapter 4 when we were earlier on in, in the book of Acts. We saw a church that came together around a common cause. And as God's church here in concert, we have a common cause. Our common cause is to love God, love him beyond everything else, put him first in our lives. And out of that, love and care for one another. In verse 32, it said, those who believed were of one heart and soul. Are we of one heart and soul, church? Do we look out for one another? You know, we put it on the slogans, we call it everybody cares. Are we of one heart and soul? Do you know, we can choose a different way, can't we? We can choose to prefer others above ourselves, and in doing so, actually, we get rewarded, Do you know the Bible tells us it's better to give than receive, doesn't it? Jesus told us that. It's better to give than receive. And I know that's true. You know, as a father, giving something to John is far better than me getting stuff. Giving matters. Let's give with all that we've got. Let's be generous in our lives. And let's live for the cause of Christ. You know, God has called each and every one of us with purpose. You are not useless. If you're sat here in a seat, that doesn't make you a bench warmer. Nobody in this church is a bench warmer. You are all first team picks. God has chosen you to be his person. You are called with purpose to be a witness. Do you know, um, I'm sure she won't mind me telling you, but, you know, she's not here, so she can't argue with me. But, you know, Lissell never picked up a microphone and hosted a service or preached the way that she does in this church before she started coming to this church. She'd been a Christian for years. She'd grown up as a faithful follower of Christ. But God had a purpose beyond. She simply had to step into that purpose. I wonder how many of you this morning have a purpose that you're not quite stepping into. Let me encourage you, step into the purpose that God has. You don't know what that purpose is? Well, actually, he tells us. He says we're all called to be witnesses. We are all called to be his hands and feet in our world. Do you know, let me say that Jesus' plan hasn't changed. Two years of a global pandemic, Jesus' plan to reach the lost has not changed. It's still found in his bride, still his church. We are called to be part of Jesus' solution. The church matters. Do you know, it's where the Holy Spirit moves. It's where we worship collectively together our great God. It's where we come and place him first. And it's where we are sent out to do the works that he has called us to do. The church is God's plan. So today's a day where we're going to be asking some hard questions. It's a day for asking those questions. So let me ask you, what motivates you today? What motivates you? Is it maybe the accumulation uh, of, of, of wealth? Maybe it's the love of adulation. Maybe it's that you struggle with that, that you're always wanting that attention. Do you know, as I said, I've struggled with both of those things in the past. Do you know, I reckon that probably 
10 years earlier than he actually did, God would have used me to plant a church if it wasn't for the fact that my heart wasn't in the right place. Because I wanted the adulation. When I got on the platform at church, it was, where, hey, look at me up on the stage. Aren't I cool and awesome? It wasn't about, I'm here to serve my God. Something had to change. My priority shifted to be somebody who was God-focused, Jesus-centered, and placed him first. What is our motivation? Is your motivation, the heart behind you, who you are, about Jesus and his church? Let me encourage you, be people in love with Jesus. You want to get closer to him. You want to know him more. You want to live in relationship with him. And out of that, you love people. You love his church. You want to see it grow. You want to see the spirit move in this, in this place. You want to see people's lives expand. We must be motivated by placing Jesus first. Do you know, if you want to live the best Christian life, it's, it's really simple, but it's actually really difficult. Because Jesus sums it up for us, doesn't he? He says, what does he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's the first commandment. Put God first. Put no one before him. And then have a heart for building his church. Do you know, one of the things I love about the book of Acts is there's all these moments where it says, and God added to their number, and God added to their number. And do you know, we are a church here in concert where God is adding to our number. You know, today in church, there is 32 people. This time six months ago, 32 people would have been a big service for us. Last week, we had 77 people in church. Do you know, because God is on the move here in concert, we are a growing church. And as a growing church, God is adding to our number daily because we are being called to be a witness. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And this is what the book of Acts is all about, to be God's witness to the world around us. So that first thing is motivation matters. What is your motivation? The next thing I want to say is deceit will be your demise. Be a people of truth. Do you know Jesus shows us that Satan is a liar and the father of all lies. Deceit is the business of Satan. And if you sat here this morning, the devil is a real thing. Do you know he can't directly make you do things. He can't directly take your hand and make you steal something. That's not how it works. The devil doesn't directly do that. What he does is he deceives you into do things. He whispers in your ear and says, no, it'll be all right. Do you know, he says those things like, you know, it's okay. You just have another line, you'll be fine. He maybe says in your ear, don't worry, just have another pint. I know you're, you're teetotal now, but just have another pint, it'll be okay. Maybe he whispers in your ear and says, you know, it's all right, just, just hold back. You don't need to, to give everything that you said you'd give. Just hold a little bit back. That was Ananias and Zephyrus thing. Don't allow Satan's lies to deceive you today. Do you know, when you speak in lies, when you speak in falsehoods, half-truths, or even withhold truth, you don't reflect the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. You reflect the image of Satan. I told you it was going to be a difficult week with some challenges and some difficult things. I want my life to reflect Jesus. As a Christian, I am called to be an image bearer of Christ, to reflect him in what I do. If I do anything else, I'm being deceitful because I'm not showing the glory of the one who is the truth. Don't allow a lie to bring you down. Choose to live today in the truth and by the truth. Do you know, Ananias and his wife, their deceit became their demise. They were found out and ultimately it killed them. Do you know, if you live outside of God's truth, it'll bring you down. It'll be your end. It'll be your undoing. So I want to move this on a little bit and I want to show you a little bit about what we need to do. And that is as Christians, we need to value holiness above wealth, reputation 
and adulation. As Christians, we're called to be holy. We're called to be set apart. But the good news is we don't do that on our own. We do it in the strength of Jesus. The Holy Spirit guides us and takes us to that place. Do you know when your goal is wealth, you'll always be poor because you'll never have enough. When your goal is adulation, you'll always feel unloved because you'll never have enough. When your goal is holiness, when your goal is living for God by his provision, when you're not talking about being poor, I'm not talking about having nothing or living in sackcloth. That's not what we're talking about. But actually, I'm talking about living holy, living in relationship with God. When your value is found in being a child of God, you're going to be complete. You're going to be found whole because your value is in who he says you are. Holiness is saying, because Jesus died for me, I'm going to live for him. And you know, when you live for God, it does, it puts your head above the precipice. People want to find those things that aren't quite right. And Paul, the apostle Paul, has a solution for this. He tells us to be above reproach. That means keep yourself right. Make decisions. Do you know, as an individual, I make decisions every day not to do things, not necessarily because they're majorly wrong, but because actually I want to stay as far away from the temptation and the danger as I possibly can. Do you know, one of the things that that I don't do is I don't give girls lifts places. Don't do that. The reason why I don't is because not that I'll do something that I shouldn't, but because it opens me up to allegation. So I don't give girls lift places because it, for me, being above reproach matters. I don't want there to be a hint of anything wrong in my life. And get, don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect, I make mistakes. But, you know, I put protections in so that I, I, I stay above reproach. Holiness is about allowing Jesus to shine through your life. When you live in holiness, you won't lack you'll be blessed. Not always in stuff, but from God. Do you know, it's that word content, isn't it? Are you content where you are? Do you allow the relationships you have, the the friendships you have, the, the community that you have, do you allow that to be enough? Or do you demand more? Being content is a godly thing. Truth matters. As followers of Christ, we need to be people of truth. Don't allow the great deceiver to, allow, to take you down a place of deception. Follow Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Holiness must come first. Do you know, as Christians, we must never value money, our reputation, or anything above holiness and our Savior. Do you put Jesus first? Do you know, Ananias' claim was to give away all that he had earned from selling his field. He valued his reputation, his adulation, the giving to the apostles, and his money, the keeping the bit that he sent, more than he did the truth and the one that he followed. We need to value what is eternal, not what is temporal. The love of God and our worship and our relationship with him, we need to value drawing closer to him. Do you know the praise of others, it'll disappear over time. It'll be gone in an instant. Monetary wealth can be so temporary and fleeting. If we set our value on either of these things, we will end up disappointed at best. Or like Analias, it might actually drive us to our grave. So, God is completely holy and pure. And we're the opposite. We are. You know, we are opposite as humans, but only in him can we be righteous. We need to fear God. You know, not like a tyrant or a dictator. He's not like Vladimir Putin. But God, and God is actually no longer our judge because the judgment has been paid in Jesus. But we need to fear God like a child with a loving father. Because our God is a loving father, but he is also an awesome God. 
and we should approach him with wonder and awe. So I'm going to, I'm way over my time, but hey, you'll just have to live with it because I've got another page to go. I want to have a look at the next set of verses because, you know, I don't want to leave it there. I don't want to leave it in the struggles and the difficulties and the pains of Ananias and Zephyra and these things. What I want to do is I want to move on and look at the signs and wonders that come when we put our lives right with God, put him first and go for him with all that we've got. So let's jump into the next verse and it says this. From verse 12 it says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done amongst the people by the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on the cots and mattresses, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were healed." So let's have a look at a few of the things of these final words. The first thing is, after Ananias and Zephyra, after the issues had been dealt with, the church saw signs and wonders. Do you know, the church was going and the hope growing and the Holy Spirit was bringing about the miraculous. With Jesus, through his disciples and in the early church, the miracles had purpose. Do you know, I want to be a church where God moves in signs and wonders, where the miraculous happens. Do you believe that God can do the impossible? Well, I believe he can do the impossible in my life, in your life, and in this church today. I believe he can do the impossible yesterday, like he did in the early church, today in this church, and tomorrow and ongoing. I believe that God will move in signs and wonders. The other thing that this verse says is it says the people viewed them with the highest esteem. Do you know, they met in Solomon's portico. This became kind of ground zero for the early church, didn't it? We've, we've seen this place before, the beautiful gate where Peter and John preached in chapter 3. Do you know, the death of Ananias and Zephyra was preceded by the power and presence of God. The fear of their own leaders led to those in opposition staying away. Peter and John had been arrested, yet they were back out doing their thing. The church was growing and God was moving. And despite the fears and despite the issue, the people around viewed the early church with the highest esteem. Because the things of Jesus shines bright in a world of darkness. And I believe here in concert, God can use us as a church to shine his light in the world around us. Let us be a place where the highest esteem, the things of Jesus, are held to account. Where this community around us says, hey, County Durham Christian Life Centre, it's a great place. We love that place, whether they're part of what we do or not. Even today, when God moves, people are left wowed. So he works in signs and wonders. The people around viewed the church with the highest esteem. And what happened? People were drawn to Jesus. Do you know the sign of any move of God is people coming to faith? Do you know you hear the phrase in church circles all the time, revival is happening. Revival is coming. But you know, a revival is not a revival because of the signs and wonders. It is not a revival because God heals people in a meeting. It's not a revival because people get knocked over in the spirit or any of this stuff happens. It's a revival when salvation comes, when people meet Jesus. We want our church to be known as a place where people meet Jesus. I want your life to be different because of an encounter with a living God. I want to be a place where the power of the Holy Spirit transforms our lives. I don't want us to be the same week on week. I want us to be transformed by the power of the Spirit. And as we start bringing this message to a close, I want to just talk a little bit about the church being an attractive place, attractional. I don't mean everybody stunning and good looking with perfectly made up faces and no guts, because that rules me out. But I want to 
be a church that is attractional to the world around us. Do you know in academia at the minute there's, this, there's been a lot of discussion about the attractional church versus the missional church. Attractional church being a church that, that draws people to it. Typically, normally larger churches are this, with high levels of excellence and high levels of community engagement and a focus on people meeting Jesus. The missional church is often more community involved in charity focus, you know, charitable organizations, um, you know, like uh, churches that are involved in community and more, more about go and do rather than come and see. But, you know, there's this division in style. And often academia lays it out of you can have one or you can have the other. But I don't believe that that's the biblical model. Do you know, I felt at uni there was this big church, this big push to say, no, no, you need to be a missional church. The attractional church was gone, that you shouldn't do that. You know, but, but that actually missional church was the way forward. They, they almost looked down on the attractional model of church. But you know what? It's the attractional church that actually is the church that's growing at the moment. When you look at the stats of the churches that are growing in number, it is the churches that follow a more attractional model. But I believe that the early church showed us a better model again. I believe that the early church shows us a model that is attractional and missional. The, church, the early church was attractional. They preached the gospel. Signs and wonders happened. They had these large public gatherings as a church. But they were missional. In their lives, Peter and John approached the lame man and said, walk. They met his need. We need to be a church that is both attractional and missional. And as we conclude, let me conclude with this. The church matters. You know, post-COVID, Jesus has not changed his mind. He's not said, we will build our online Zooms or whatever. No, he said, I'll build my church. That hasn't changed. Jesus said he was build his church. This hasn't changed. COVID hasn't changed that. As Christians, we need to value the church. We need to dedicate our lives to being part of building it. I mean, globally, but also here in concert. God's plan is still plan A, to love and build his bride, the church. So let me ask you, are you in? Are you in on this thing? Can we build God's church together? Can we be attractional in what we do? Can we be a church where people think, whoa, what's going on in there? Citizens' house is like, is like jumping up and down because there's something going on in there on a Sunday morning. People want to come to see what we're doing. Are we attractional in what we do? But are we missional in our approach to the world around us? Are we reaching out to those we know need to hear the gospel? Do you know, I think charities are great. I think food banks are phenomenal. I think all these things are great. But do you know what? We're different. We are the church. We have something that is more important. Yes, we can meet people's needs. Yes, we can be part of the solution for people. But actually, we have the greatest gift. And that gift is a relationship with Jesus Christ. We are called to be his witnesses. As a church, we want to get behind charities, but we want to get behind it because of who we are in him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you have called us to be part of your church. Thank you that here in concert you are moving, that you're adding to our number daily those that are being saved. Lord, thank you that lives are being transformed in this place. And that we can call you our Lord and Saviour. Holy Spirit, move in this place. Meet each, each of us in this room, Lord. Father, draw us close to you. Lord, I pray that our value be in a place of holiness. In our relationship with you. That our worth be in who you say we are. Lord, thank you that we're your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.